Malcolm Gladwell, you were born in England. You lived in Canada for most of your youth. And for many years now, you're, you've been in New York. What connection do you feel to Jamaica today? Well, I have an immigrant's connection to uh, Jamaica, as I do to England and as I do now to Canada, um, which means it's, um, you know, it's a rose-colored glasses kind of thing. Um, but I also have to remind myself that we left Jamaica, right? Um, just as we then left England and then I left, a pattern is emerging. Um, but uh, so, you know, the immigrants have complex relationships to their places of origin. Um, and, uh, you know, immigrants, the thing about immigrants is that you, it is, we're, we're back on this sort of uh, morally problematic thing again, because um, by virtue of leaving a country, an immigrant changes the not just the country they come to, but they change the country they leave. And this is the part of it. We always talk about how immigrants change the country they go to. That we can see. We forget that it's true about their place of origin. Um, In the sense of their own memory, reconstruction, no, they, perception? They, 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 by virtue of their absence, they leave a mark. So if you think about Jamaica, who left Jamaica? Enormous numbers of middle class people. Um, my family among them. We altered Jamaica, and not necessarily for the better, by leaving, right? Um, uh, Jamaica lost its, its educated, its, um, its professional class, its huge numbers of them to Miami, New York, Toronto, and London, right? It's, and so that's, there's that part, that every immigrant who feels that way in some sense. The South Koreans who came to the United States were the same thing. It's exactly the same uh, anthropological phenomenon. The exact same class from South Korea left South Korea and carry that burden with them in a sense. Um, do, you, do you ever go back? Yes, oh yeah, we, we would go back many uh, repeatedly when I was growing up. Uh, but the other thing, you know, if I might continue on this theme, I know you want to take it back to my, but I'd like to go into broader issues of <laughs> <laughs> take it away from me, but um, is, um, you know, you also help to preserve the country that you came from by leaving, right? Who leaves a country? The people who are most unhappy with the country, right? So if the country that you're leaving is actually functional, and you leave because you're unhappy with its functionality, you're doing your country a favor by immigrating. immigrating. So this is how I feel about Canada. I feel like I was one of those people, if I'd left, I would have been just a problem. And by leave, by, so by leaving for America, which is far less, far more dysfunctional, and therefore far more kind of um, welcoming to a dysfunctional person like me, I have, <laughs> I have helped to preserve that which I love about Canada by absenting myself. <laughs> Did you see what I'm saying? That, that, that is the most twisted logic. <laughs> no, I think it, I actually think it's crystal clear to me. <laughs> Did you experience racism when you were growing up? Wait, I have one more point to make. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, there's a famous book written by Alfred Albert or Alfred O. Hirschman called Exit, Voice, and Loyalty, in which he points this out, out this very fact, which is that when you are dissatisfied with the institution or country or whatever that you're a part of, you have three options. You can leave, exit. You can voice, you can stay and complain. Or you can be loyal. You can shut up and, right? And he points out that at different points, in different situations, we all uh, adopt one of those options and forget about the other two. So immigrants, exit, uh, immigrants um, uh, exercise exit, right? Economists only understand exit. Political scientists only understand voice. Uh, public schools are run into problems when they don't do well because the only way people, people's principal form of opposition to a bad public school is exit, but their principal form of opposition to a bad private school is voice. Right? There's all these kind of wonderful but, little conundrum. What were you dissatisfied with in Canada that made you leave? Or were you not just seeking opportunity elsewhere? Or is, does that implicitly suggest dissatisfaction with Canada? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, I think I felt I had, um, I, had, I had been to America a couple of times 
during college. And I felt that it, at the time, this is many, many years ago, um, it felt more, more open to me. Particularly, it felt more open to young people. Um, and I think that's because I had gone to Washington, D.C. And Washington, D.C. is a place that's uh, run by 25-year-olds. I mean, run is too strong a word, but it's peopled by everyone is young. And so you get the sense, oh. And I didn't feel like that was true of Toronto, that it was run by 25-year-olds. Um, and so that was my kind of, and I think I was, at the time, not wrong. I don't think I would, I don't think it's true as true today, but. And how did your mixed race heritage affect your experience in Canada and versus the US at the time? Well, I, it was never an issue in Canada. I never even came up, I don't remember. And partly because of, University of Toronto when I went there was, well, the, the, the we grew up in Elmira in Southern Ontario, a very, um, uh, strongly Mennonite community. And the Mennonites are, one of their many wonderful traits is their openness and their tolerance. So that was never an issue. And then I went to Trinity College, University of Toronto, which was so effortlessly diverse at that point anyway, that I, I, I didn't even remotely stand out on that. I mean, it was a college full of people from every corner of the globe. And so it wasn't until I, Ameri it wasn't until I moved to America and I discovered what a big deal Americans make out of race. Um, and you realize how toxic. The American racial experience was so toxic um, and continues to be toxic. We're still seeing, we're still dealing with the residue. You cannot imprison, essentially imprison, enslave 10% or 15% of your population for 100 years or more and expect that stain to be removed easily. And people, you know, every now and again, the, my biggest frustration, particularly with conservatives in America, is they want to pretend it's over, right? And it isn't over. You know, they're, and I don't, you have to be, I was just, just now, I was just telling my parents, because just this weekend I was reading a book about Birmingham, about the great civil rights marches in, in Birmingham in 1963. And this book is this incredibly powerful reminder that if you can find a difference, or you, or let me phrase this differently, uh, you cannot find a difference between Johannesburg in 1960 and Birmingham in 1960. They are equivalent. You can go down the list. You know, black people were effectively barred from living in all but a small handful of neighborhoods. They were completely absent from any power structure in that town. They were effectively barred from voting. And we're talking about a city that was 40% African American in 1960, right? There's no difference. That's apartheid. That's what it is, right? Now, it is the particular brilliance of Americans, since I'm bashing countries tonight, <laughs> that, you know, 20 years after that, they were, they were presuming to lecture the South Africans about apartheid. Now, someone had to lecture the South Africans about apartheid. Apartheid was a terrible, terrible thing. But it is the height of moral audacity for that lecture to be coming from the United States. Give me a break. <laughs> they, they were, 20 years is not long enough. There's a statute of limitations that ought to, <laughs> 20 years, it's one lifetime, right? And by the way, they still hadn't cleaned up their act. So when you sort of, Birmingham in the 60s, there were people, they were, they were grown men with the sanction of the leading elders of that town going around throwing dynamite into the homes of black people. This is in 1958, right? I mean, after the marches of 63, they dynamited 16th Street Baptist Church, the most important black church in, I mean, this is, this is, this is in, in my lifetime. <laughs> uh, had to check there for a second. I, I know. Um, so just to go back to your experience in the States, you, yeah. were, you were made more aware. I mean, moving to Washington initially, you were made more aware of your racial identity? Or how did it affect you? Yeah, I mean, it was an issue. Uh, uh, not a kind of, 
not an issue in the sense that I was mistreated, but just in an issue that you can't forget that fact, right? Whereas in, when I was growing up, I forgot this fact conveniently for years upon end. Um, but you can't in the United States, it just comes up. Um, you even said you wrote your book Blink because you grew your hair out. Yeah, and then, yeah, this, it seems so, <laughs> yeah, I had, had very short hair and then I grew a big afro and then all of a sudden it was like suddenly occurred to people that I was black and then, <laughs> uh, and then I just in little sort of small, really kind of fascinating ways, my life changed. Not in huge ways, but, you know, I jokingly, but it's sort of true that I started getting speeding tickets. Um, <laughs> and by the way, there's things that you don't notice until you become aware of these facts. So I started to get speeding tickets, and I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And then I would drive down, there's stretches of American interstates that I like to refer to as contested in the sense that there's a cop every five miles, right? So you drive down a contested stretch of interstate, and you start to notice, well, who's getting pulled over for speeding, right? So I would note, and what you, when you start to pay attention, you notice, wait a minute, it's almost all young black men. Now, as a percentage of the American driving population, young black men are not large. Let's say they're 2%, right? But I would start to keep track, right? And easily on a contested stretch, it would be 50% of those pulled over. Now that's weird, right? It sort of demands explanation. It's not, it's just those kinds of things that you start to become aware of. And when you read, you know, so when you say something like little fascinating ways, that's what you're referring to? Yeah, like getting tickets or getting the time. I think I recounted in the afterward to the book or the beginning about getting, walking along 14th Street one day and a police car drives up on the sidewalk and three cops jump out, one black woman and two white guys, and they have a sketch of a rapist. And the two white guys are insisting that I am that I resemble the rapist. Now, I didn't resemble the rapist. Now, we didn't even get to the question of whether I could be a rapist. I was like, look, this is just not me. And the black woman was like, it's not him. They were, <laughs> it was this hilarious thing where just because the rapist has got curly hair and this guy's got curly hair doesn't mean it's the same guy, right? And so there's this long conversation, which was comic in a way, because she was there and she was laughing throughout because she was like, and apologizing implicitly for these two rubes um, who she was with. But like, you know, that's an odd thing to happen. It's not every day that that happens to one. Um, you know? No. Other, I mean, obviously, it, it, other than being the inspiration of a book, did it make you uncomfortable? Or you just, you, you have a way of, of, obviously, a way of dealing with this sort of thing? Well, it didn't make me uncomfortable because I, don't, I didn't feel I had a right to be uncomfortable because what I was going through was 0.0001% of what young black men go through in American cities. So all that's, you know, you read these accounts, I've been reading them for years, every now and again you would read someone or someone would say or they would write, a young black man would say, you have no idea what my life is like, I get stopped by blah blah blah. And you all, part of you always says, really? You don't really believe it. And then you realize when this happens to you, you're like, oh, that's actually true. And then when something like um, uh, that case down in, uh, uh, in Florida happens, um, you realize that's a young black guy walks back to his family house and some guy runs after him with a gun and shoots him, right? You know, that's a kind of, this has not happened to people who, um, to, uh, the same kid who happens to be white. And so, you, you know, there's a kind of, and then there's the whole thing about how often the police stop you. Um, and I actually got into this in my new book that I'm writing, and if you, you know, they keep statistics on this. How many times do they stop young black men and frisk them in the city of New York? And it is a non-trivial number, right? It's thousands and thousands of times. Um, and your new book is about something called Desirable Difficulty? Well, no, yeah, there's a theme that's explored in the book. I, I, my new book is about, um, it's about power. It's about confrontations between the powerful and the powerless. And so I'm very interested in things like how do the police deal with criminals. Um, and one of the ways in which 
the police of New York City made New York a very safe place was to relentlessly harass perfectly innocent young black men. Right? Like all of these issues, it's very messy. It's not, it's not simple, right? So everyone, is, everyone who enjoys the safety of New York is in some sense morally complicit in the treatment of young black men. What do you do about that fact, right? Um, it's hard. And just to stay with that for a moment, uh, where did the idea for this particular book come from? I mean, ideas accrue in all different ways and, and, and origins and sources and so on, but for this, this book about power, what, what fueled you in that? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it was in the air. So you had Arab Spring and you had all these things happening. Um, and then you have, uh, I, the, I, for me, the, it's, hard, it's weird to talk about this way, but I found that for me, the Iraq war was a very radicalizing experience. And I don't mean radicalizing in the sense that um, in the same way that it, Vietnam War was radicalizing. But it really kind of, um, it woke me up. Um, the casualness with which America enlisted its own power against another country. On the, the flimsiest, you know, it was clear at the time and then grew even more clear as time went on, just how flimsy their reasons for invading were. And you know, the invasion, and the other thing that, this is a thing that has driven me crazy about the United States. Um, when they talk about the cost of war, they will say, of Vietnam, they will say, 40,000 American lives were lost. And you hear that over and again, you think, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you realize, wait a minute, why is that the relevant number? A million Vietnamese lost their lives in that war, a number which never comes up, and which is, I would think, a good deal more relevant to the conversation. And so in, in Iraq, everything was about what it cost us, us meaning America, and not about what it cost them. Um, and I, I began to sort of think, you know, this is, there's this, this strain of arrogance that runs through the powerful. It's not just America. It's that it runs through the powerful. You know, and you see it when uh, a big uh, private equity guy in New York, you know, the, this is a digression, but this is another one of these moments for me. It's a guy named Steve Schwartzman, billionaire. And because he makes his money in private equity, he pays capital gains on his income, not income tax. So if he makes a billion dollars, he doesn't pay 50% tax, he pays 15% tax, right? So Obama said, reasonably, it's not really capital gains, that's income. Maybe you should pay what every other American pays. And Schwartzman described that move to get him to pay real person's taxes. He, may said, it, he said it was, uh, he likened it to Kristallnacht. Now, it's not Kristallnacht. <laughs> I, mean, I think we can safely say this is not an appropriate comparison. Um, but the question is, why do you say that if you're Steve Schwartzman? He's not a dumb guy. He's not a horrible guy. He's not a bad guy. He's actually he's someone who, maybe on balance, he's made the American economy a better place. But there is something about his position and what has happened to him by virtue of the amount of power and wealth that he's accumulated that has created a kind of uh, blind spot, right? Where his logic would be, look, I am someone who is building wealth in this country. I'm part of what this country needs to get back on his feet. Now, whether that's true or not, I have no interest in whether it. It's what he believes, perhaps legitimately. And so he thinks any step that puts a crimp in my efforts to make this economy great is an out, a moral outrage in a way, right? Now, to me, I'm fascinated by how someone can go through that series of steps and end up where he ended up. So that's what I wanted to discuss, which is what happens to people when they get power? Right? Why do they start to make these crazy errors? Um, and that, so that's where the book comes from. Malcolm Gladwell with me at the Toronto Reference Library. He's my guest on Writers and Company on CBC Radio 1, on Sirius Satellite Radio 159, and around the world on cbc.ca. I'm Eleanor Wachtel. Malcolm Gladwell, one theme that connects many of your stories 
is entrepreneurial style. And in a, in a piece you wrote for The New Yorker last year called The Color of Money, you begin with the career of Helena Rubinstein, who created a famous line of cosmetics, a very colorful character. Can you tell me a bit about her? Oh, yeah. This was a piece. So there were, there were two marvelous books written about the early pioneers in the cosmetics industry. And one was this book about, um, about Helena Rubinstein, who is this... Uh, She's such an extraordinary character. She sort of uh, she she grows up in a little tiny uh, in the sort of the Jewish ghettos of Warsaw or Krakow. Krakow, and uh, emigrates to Vienna and then to Australia and basically reimagines herself. And she's the first person to figure out that if you make uh, cosmetics, even very crude ones, and you put them in a really cool looking container, and you <laughs> Uh, and you charge 50 times more than it costs you to make it, and you sell it in a really beautiful looking boutique, you could make a lot of money. Um, and so she, and she's this extraordinary character, and she builds this massive um, uh, cosmetics fortune, and she is, um, I'm trying to remember, she has, the, <laughs> she has this, I'm trying to remember this great story from her. She goes and sees the, uh, Oh, I can't remember. Anyway, she's one of those kind of a quota minute kind of people. Um, and she has famously the, uh, the uh, most expensive and worst uh, art collection in all of New York. Um, and well, you said that she has, she collects the worst pictures by the best artists. Yes, that's right. Yes, she had all the, she basically is one of those people with, uh, who, with incredibly fabulous bad taste. And... Um, <laughs> She just is this kind of meteor that streaks across the business. And, to, and I was interested in writing about her because I was comparing herself, comparing her with the guy who founds um, L'Oreal, um, which is founded more or less at the same time, but by a completely different kind of person, um, by someone who wasn't doing it by dint, wasn't, wasn't, she was essentially manufacturing dreams for women. And the guy who founds L'Oreal, L'Oreal is based on science. And and he was a chemist, Eugene Schuler. He was Schuller. a chemist, yes, Eugene Schuler. Um, and she was this Jewish, obviously Jewish, and this kind of, um, your heart went out to her, and she was this sort of fabulous, warm, hilarious, crazy woman. And he was this cold-blooded, um, and in, famously, during the Second World War, he's a collaborator, right? And he realizes if he wants to continue to make money during the war, he's got to play nice with the Nazis. He's, he's in Paris. He's, he's in Paris. Paris. Yeah. Um, and so their, their paths, they're both in the same business, but their paths diverge in this really fascinating way. Um, and uh, and he, he is hanging out in the early 40s with some of the most despicable people in France, um, with these thugs who are blowing up synagogues. And, you know, um, and he's fine with it. And then when he senses that the Nazis are going to lose, that's when he changes course overnight and starts shoveling all kinds of money at the resistance. And, essentially buys his way. And he's hanging out with a cabal of people um, who then later on become some of the most famous and powerful people in all of France. And of course, you know, the woman, uh, Lillianne Betancourt, who has been immersed in this huge scandal because she was worth like whatever. Gazillion. 10, 10 billion euro. And she gave a billion euro to her, um, her much younger lover and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and people got very upset, although if you're worth 10 billion euro and you give 1 billion euro to your much younger lover, that's no different from having $10,000 and giving $1,000 to someone. So if you had 10,000 and you gave $1,000 to the person who was your lover, you would think, how very nice and generous of you. <laughs> but if you have 10 billion euro and you give, or 10,000, whatever, 10 euro, and you give you give one, year, one billion euro to you, what, if people get so, why, it's the same math. Uh, like, why is it so, people forget if you're that rich, you just have to keep adding zeros. <laughs> if she wants to leave a tip of a million dollars for dinner, it's fine. She has 10 billion euro. <laughs> she can leave a billion, you know, it's fine. It's, I, I've never understood. Anyway, people got very upset. <laughs> 